Good afternoon, everybody. I am really delighted to be here with you. Just imagine what you would do if you had clarity. Now, that's why we've created these web event series called Full Disclosure, so that you can get clarity on the topics that really, really matter to you. Now, like us, you've probably been overwhelmed by the number of web events that are happening at the moment, and some good and some maybe not so good, and you probably got bored with a lot of the pitch style events that are happening. So we wanted to create something a little different, and that's why we've created Full Disclosure. So this is no holds barred, open, frank conversations on areas that really, really matter to your firm. So everything you wanted to ask, but were either too afraid to do so or didn't want to look stupid, I am happy to do that for you. So please put your questions to, to through me. I don't mind looking stupid. Uh, or perhaps you just weren't worried that people were going to not really, really tell you what the truth was or what they were thinking. So what we've got is full disclosure, practical insights, real facts, experience, war stories, all the good stuff, all the bad stuff, and even more. And today I am really excited to be joined with Paul in the background. So Paul is going to be chipping in and probably helping me with some questions. So that's really, really awesome. He's a good friend, a longtime friend, and actually a co-author with our guest today. So I'm excited to be joined by the, uh, by obviously by Paul, but by the legendary Ron Baker. Now, I suppose I could do the usual and say Ron uh, started out life at KPMG in 1984 in San Francisco in their private advise, business advisory function that he, you know, then set up his own firm and was obsessed with total quality service. He gave lots of lectures at the CPA, CPA in California before going on to write a gazillion books on so many great, great topics. One really great book with, with our, our co-friend here, Paul Dunn, called Firm of the Future. And if you haven't read Firm of the Future, then I seriously urge you to go and get Firm of the Future. And Ron subsequently has lectured and talked all around the world about value pricing. But I think more importantly, I'd like to introduce Ron as somebody that's probably had a dramatic impact on so many practitioners around the world without Ron even knowing it. And I think that's probably a testament to the, the thoughts, the innovation, the, 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 the commentary, the practical steps and insights and guides that, that Ron has brought through over the years. And he's probably ahead of his time on certain topics that we'll be getting through today. Um, and uh, certainly on one issue in probably particular, we're going to have some uh, arguments or bun fights on. So please do challenge Ron. He's a great at uh, defending his position. But I just wanted to say thanks to Ron because Ron had a massive impact on my accounting firm and he doesn't even know it. So thanks, Ron. And thanks from all those accountants out there that probably you don't even know are, are very, very grateful to you. So welcome, Ron. Well, thanks, Ainsley. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, I didn't know Paul was going to join us in the background. So unfortunately, Paul's not up on screen, but please do engage on social media as well. You've got our Twitter handles there. So Ainsley Damery and Ronald Baker. So do please take uh, photographs if you want to. We're going to kill these slides and go into a more uh, I suppose, easier conversational chat format to get stuck for, for most of the session. So uh, do do get involved, do get involved in, in social media and on LinkedIn. Please connect with all of us on LinkedIn too. Uh, we'd love, love, love to see you. So without further ado, I'm going to stop share and get into uh, hopefully a bit more of a fireside chat view for our audience so that we can, as this is a fireside chat, I thought we would use Zoom's immersive fireside chat view. So Ron, hopefully it's not going to put you as look too weird talking at me rather than across to me but no, no, let's that's get fine. good Ron okay so back in the 90s it was your mission and stated mission to bury the bill of hour so your mission in life was to bury the bill of the hour how do you think that's going and what do you say to those people that just simply won't let it go mission accomplished the billable hour is dead <laughs> The billable hour is absolutely dead. It's uh, It's got no defenders. The people that are using it just don't realize it's dead. Um, we, You know, you don't need 100% adoption of an idea uh, before the old one dies. All I need is 10 or 15% to create uh, that tipping point, and we're there. It, that, that issue is dead to me. We've won the intellectual battle, the war of ideas on the billable hour. Um, so many firms now, uh, the last report I saw from the ICPA, various state societies, other entities track this, around 40% of firms are doing some form of fixed pricing or value-based pricing. Now, I know there's fuzzy definitions in there, but 40%, 40% of 
when I started in the 90s, it didn't even it wasn't even a question on the surveys. So mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. The billable hour is dead. We just haven't had the funeral yet. Okay. And what do you say that won't let go to the billable hour? Uh, wake up. <laughs> you know, I, uh, it's a this is a customer issue. It, it, the billable hour is a crappy customer experience, which is why I started to move away from it in 1989. I was studying at the time companies like Disney and Lexus and FedEx and Nordstrom and L.L. Bean and Gore-Tec, and I wanted to emulate phenomenal customer experience. And the billable hour is a crappy customer experience. And now scroll forward 34 years or whatever it's been, and you've got Amazon, one click, you get your stuff sometimes the same day or the next day. That's what your customers are comparing you to, whether you know it or not. We compete against any organization that has the ability to raise our customers' expectations. So I would just ask all those firms out there that bill by the hour, how is your interface, how is your convenience, your frictionless interaction with your customers compared to Amazon's? And if you don't up your game, you're not going to have customers because they're going to go where they where they're treated well and get great service. And that's now the benchmark. Fantastic. That quote that you are in competition with, you know, people who you don't even realize. So your customers, if they've touched somebody and it's been an outstanding experience, even if they've not been in accounting, then they're going to relate that to their experience with you. And I think that comes from that Disney. I can't, I, so I can't remember off the top of my head, but. I certainly know you've talked about that quote too. Yes, that comes from Disney and other places as well. I mean, if you study great customer service companies like FedEx, like Disney, they never talk about it because they know they constantly fall short. They know where there's problems. And so they don't brag about it. They just try and go out there and do it better every day. Uh, and if you've got a family of four that goes down, spends a few grand in a couple of weeks in Disney World, they're going to come back. They're going to be a heck of a lot less tolerant about lousy service from their hairdresser, their barber, their local restaurant, their coffee shop, and their dry cleaner. Uh, and dare I say it, their accountant. Indeed. Okay, so let, let's just, I suppose, get on a common understanding of what value pricing is, if we could, just, just because most of this conversation is probably going to be around value pricing. So some people and some of the audience that are going to be here today think value pricing is about success pricing, so a percentage of outcome, a percentage of success. So what exactly do you mean by value pricing one? Value pricing is charging a price commensurate with the value that you create before you begin the work. So value pricing prices the customer. It doesn't price the product or the service. It prices the customer, which is why you see so much uh, work being done on customer segmentation. You know, the airlines, first class, business class, hotels, loyalty programs, these other ways to segregate customers into different segments because different people have different willingness to pay. The advantage that the airlines have or the uh, accounting firms have over say a company like Apple or indeed the airlines or the hotels is we meet with every customer anyway. So the marginal cost of sitting down and having an in-depth value conversation with every customer, we're, we should be doing that anyway, just as a, a professional uh, do care responsibility. So it doesn't cost us anymore where, you know, United Airlines can't sit down and grill me, Bron, why are you flying to Australia? Is it business? Is it leisure? You know, it would be too expensive for them, but we can do it relatively easy. So it's about pricing the customer not the product or service. Fantastic. So upfront is an explanation in, in, in arrears is an excuse is probably a good, a good bite yeah, size. Yeah. Bit I, of this I mean, to say, to say upfront pricing is redundant. Pricing is always done upfront, period. There is no such thing as value billing because value billing takes place in arrears. Um, and just one more thing, I, I, I do realize there's a lot of people out there that think value pricing means success fee. And success fee, contingency fee, can certainly be an arrow in the quiver, but it's not, it's not really the only thing, the only way to achieve value pricing. So just wanted to make that clear too. Thank you. And how would you say the elements from an accounting firm break down? What makes value pricing work in practice? So what are the various components of value pricing that, that, that set it apart and make it stand out from a practical perspective? Well, for an accountant. 
you, you, you know, the old joke, how's your wife relative to what, right? I mean, relative to the billable hour, uh, value pricing provides certainty. It provides absolute predictability, being able to budget it from the customer standpoint. They're never going to be surprised by your invoice. You're never going to do any unauthorized work on their behalf and then surprise them later with a bill. In other words, you're not going to bill and duck like a lot of firms that bill by the hour do. Um, and so you're creating a better customer experience. You're doing a better job at managing expectations because you know when you go through the onboarding process what their expectations are. How do they define a successful relationship with their accounting firm? How do they want to be communicated with? How often do they want to be communicated with? All of this is gleaned from the value conversation. And so you're doing a better job. Hopefully you're asking more beautiful questions uh, on onboarding. You know, a lot of firms that value price are getting really, really good at the art of the value conversation. And they're getting feedback like, wow, I've never been asked that by a CPA firm before. That's the exact kind of feedback you wanna hear. We should be asking questions and in fact, more beautiful questions because Socrates said half the wisdom comes in the question, not the answer. So, so on, on this, so pricing, I think most people will agree that if we can agree a good price for the customer up front or the clients up front, and then we go about doing the work, sometimes the, the scoping of that work becomes tricky. And then some assignments or engagements, it's really tricky to get at the outset. How do we deal with scope creep, um, which inevitably happens? And yes, it's fine to say yes, extra work orders, but what happens if we have a, how do we manage that in practice, I suppose, is the question, because that's scope creep. Yeah, like scope creep has never happened to anybody else before. Uh, it, contractors deal with it every day. Auto mechanics deal with it every day. You know, they go to fix your car for one thing, get in there and find two other things that are wrong. How do they deal with it? That was my question. You know, why aren't auto mechanics getting complaints about their bill? Well, because they go through this process called a change request or a change order where they actually call you up, tell you what else they found out uh, that's wrong and ask you what you want to do about it. So the great thing about that is it communicates to the customer early it again sets their expectations and it keeps them in the driver's seat about how they wanna make the decision. No, don't fix my brakes, close it up and I'll have my brother-in-law fix it, but at least I get to decide as the customer. So the change order, probably one of the most sophisticated pricing tools ever developed, I think out of the contracting industry. Uh, why the professional firms haven't been using it has always baffled me. It's a beautiful tool, it's a communication tool that completely manages expectations. So that's how you deal with scope creep, is you do change requests. And now people get worried about that because they think, well, if something's changing so drastically, I'm gonna end up nickel and diming my client. That's true. You have to set a price that's got enough wiggle room in there for you to maneuver. Uh, but the bottom line is when I hear accountants say to me, well, you know, this, this project is really a black hole we don't really know. There's a lot of uncertainty in this, and we just don't know, you know, what we're going, what's going to happen. It's like, really? Then should you even be doing the job in the first place? I mean, we have a professional due care to our customers to do things that we know how to do and that we're competent at. Last thing I want to hear from my surgeon being wheeled into the OR is, "Wow, look at that! I've never seen that before. I got the wrong <laughs> surgeon." <laughs> <laughs> okay, class. I love it. Good, good response. Now, Andrew's got a question. So let's let's jump into Andrew's question because we are talking about pricing. Um, but I want to get back to that that airline analogy because I think that's really, really important that we get that and we hammer that point. I'm gonna hammer that point home for our for our attendees if you don't mind Ron. But uh Andrew's asking, how would you value price something like interim CFO services where the delivery is highly variable? So we've just had some elements of that in, in the conversation we've just had. If we're using traditional billable hours concept, it would be like four days a month on one month. Sometimes it's, it's six days a month. Some days it's five, three, whatever. So it's variable to work um, and highly variable. And therefore, how would you value price something like interim CFO work? I think I know your answer to that, but let's, let's, let's shoot. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different ways, actually. Um, 
you know, but I certainly wouldn't look at time. I mean, this is the problem. We go back to this variability of time. Stop linking time to value. Time, the only place time matters is in prison for crying out loud. The customer doesn't care about time and time is not something that your customers buy. Time is nothing but a constraint, especially in project management. Time's a constraint. It's not cost. It's not price. It's not value. Um, and one of the things when you get into those CFO services is I would look at, well, what would it cost them to have a full-time CFO? And then that would certainly be, you know, one benchmark that you could use. Now, if we're going to talk about value pricing 2.0, put them on subscription and just do whatever it takes. If you're a truly a knowledge worker, meaning you're an expert in your field, what matters is people want access to you. And I, I rather be in a world where I'm selling my brains than my hands. I don't want to be a pair of hands because there's not a lot of money in implementation. Implementation is, it requires capacity. It requires all these different things. But if, if I can just be present and add value from a strategic level, that's what I want to price for. And you can't measure that by time because I could have a million idea, a million dollar idea in a board meeting. You know, what do I put on my timesheet to, to measure value? based on time is like plunging a ruler into the oven to determine its temperature. It's the wrong measuring device. Do you think it's because accountants see themselves as service workers rather than knowledge workers? And, and deep down there's this kind of like failure to, to understand their true worth and true value and perhaps a little bit of Absolutely. imposter syndrome. Absolutely. We, we think that the, the only value that we create is in that implementation and the doing of the tax return, doing of the books, doing whatever, you know, a CFO's more banal functions are. But that's not where our value is. Our value is in the diagnostics. Our value is in the strategies and ideation and the uh, things that uh, we come up with from, you know, uh, from our brain power. It's not in the execution. Let me, let me say something that's completely counterintuitive. It's probably going to cause a lot of questions and is very controversial. Ideas. Ideas are always and everywhere more valuable than their execution. I rather live in the country that comes up with the idea of the iPhone than the country that merely executes it. It's a big difference there. And we need to be paid for our ideas, not so much the execution. In fact, if your ideas over time can crowd out the execution, so you don't have to do the implementation, let somebody else do that. You want to be the ideation and the strategy person. Wow, well, that's, that certainly goes against what, what, what our friend Paul Dunn would say, which is the value of any idea is only ever in the implementation. Um, so that, that's a very interesting, interesting angle. Well, well it, it, Paul, Paul and I have had many conversations about that. Um, and, it, and I think in Paul's defense, and Paul, you can chime in, but uh, it's got to be a good idea. Because here's my problem with it. You, this, you, hear, you, hear, you, hear, you hear suits in Hollywood say this all the time. Oh, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's, it's, the, only, it's the execution. Really? Ideas are a dime? Good ideas. I'm talking about good ideas. Good ideas are a dime a dozen? Then why do we have remakes of the Dukes of Hazard and Bewitched and all these other terrible sequel movies that come out? Because there's a dearth of ideas. Try implementing a crappy idea and tell me how far you get. Awesome. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I think the thread that we're bringing through all of this is down to great service, outstanding service to start with. So, uh, you know, I, you know, we're not talking about doing accounts just OK. We're talking about doing accounts and tax returns brilliantly. It's the it's the other work that we're adding on top. It's that to, it's that total dedication to the customer, I think, is, is coming through very, very clearly. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is especially true in, in value pricing 2.0 when you start talking about subscription, because you're creating an environment that's peace of mind, convenience for the customer and totally frictionless. So, you know, when, when you're doing those CFO services and, and you, you, or any type of service and there's a scope creep, well, now you got to go to the department of paperwork and get a triplicate change order and you got to have a conversation. No, just do it because they're on subscription. You're not looking at the math of the moment. You're comparing it to the lifetime value of the customer. And that's really what makes value pricing 2.0 different is it's not pricing the customer, it's pricing the lifelong relationship. 
Okay. Can I get, we're, we're going to get on to 2.0 quite, okay. in quite a bit, in a little bit, but can I get back to this adaptive pricing, that, that, that beautiful analogy you gave in Firm of the Future. So we were talking, and for those that haven't read Firm of the Future effectively, and Ron will probably describe it, and I will ask him to describe it a little bit more beautifully than I'm going to do. But effectively on an airline, we have limited capacity and limited numbers of seats and a limited number of flights. And we have various different classes within an airline. So there will be a first class, business class, you know, full, full paying uh, coach. Um, there will be discounted tickets and, and various other things. And, when an airline releases the seats, they will hold back certain seats, but they will only hold back seats in first business and full paying. They will never hold back seats in the discounted in the discounted seats. And then as we get towards the, the flight taken off, the prices rise. But again, we're only talking about those uh, more expensive uh, fares that are going to, to increase with those most expensive classes. Now, in an accounting firm, strangely and perversely, we seem to divert resources always from our first and business class paying clients to our E's or F's or whatever we've got, our D's, E's and F's. And why do we do that? Firstly, why do we create and allow extra capacity at the last minute for those clients? I'm always thinking tax return season in both the US and the UK are chaotic when we've probably diverted a huge amount of firm resources at the last minute to deal with really uh, low paying work. But even just during the year, why do we divert resources from our, our top uh, customers, our, our, our business class and, and first class passengers in accounting, Ron? Why do we do that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. My, our late colleague, Paul O'Byrne, used to say if accountants ran airlines on a 747, the second story would not be in the front of the plane. It would be in the back of the plane. Not only do we reserve capacity for the low fare travelers, we actually add capacity for them. An airline will never add capacity for coach passengers. They'll add capacity for first class or business class, but they're not going to add you know, more planes or do more routes uh, if it's just filled with low fare passengers. Uh, not not a, a, you know, a traditional airline, a, a Ryanair might. I mean, the, the, the low cost airlines will add capacity for low fare. But the point is that not only is it, it, it you've got to think of your capacity in terms of you you've only got so much mental capacity yes you have physical capacity given your firm's current size how many team members how many customers can you adequately serve now a lot of people a lot of firms will try and run at 90 95 percent some dare i say even try and run at 100 percent capacity that's crazy you've got to always have spare i don't think you should be running any more than 60 or 70 percent capacity you need to always have spare capacity. Why? Because you're a knowledge worker. And if I, if you call your dentist, you know, and you have a toothache and he says, well, I can fit you in in three weeks. How are you going to feel? You know, no, you, you want your doctors, you want your professionals to always have capacity to deal with emergencies or, you know, things that you want really uh, on a, on a quick timeline. And so we should, we should not confuse being busy with being profitable. And to, to, to directly answer your question, why do we do this? I think it's, it's, the, it's Baker's law. I, I mean, dare I say it, but you know, bad customers drive out good customers. We think that an accounting firm is top line driven and we put revenue over profitability. Revenue is vanity, right? Where do I stack up on the top 400, 10,000 firms in the world? You know, that's all measured by revenue. That's vanity, but profit is sanity. So, I, I, you know, you can fill the plane by discounting the price, but that's not going to be very profitable. Bob Lutz, the former chairman of GM, used to say, I'd rather sell 4 million cars at a profit than 5 million at a loss. I think we're chasing, we're chasing volume over value, and we confuse the two. Is that because we, and this is a question coming from our audience, is this because we undervalue what we can do? I think we've answered this, but I, 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 let's just hammer that point because the obvious way was missed in my last question. Is this because we undervalue what we can do? Yes, I, and I think, uh, and look, this is an affliction that all professionals have, whether you're talking about lawyers, believe it or not, who everybody seems to think are really arrogant people. They're not. Uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, uh, CPAs, uh, consultants, IT consultants, actuaries, we all undervalue ourselves. Every one of us. Nobody's good at pricing themselves. If This is why actors and authors have agents. Not so they can give 15% of their gross revenue to, to them, 
but because those people can get them a better price. If, if I'm selling Paul Dunn, I'm going to be brave as a lion. I can tout Paul Dunn for, for days. And, and what a great best speaker you'll ever hear. He'll magical effect on your organization. I can get him a, a magical price. I can't do that for myself because we bring the baggage of our, you know, maybe low self-esteem or I'm not worth that much or, or I'll never be able to command prices that Paul Dunn gets. I mean, there's a million things I can put into my head that will block me from doing it. But if I have an agent, they can do it for me. And that's why I think every firm needs pricers because the pricers in your firm are your agents. They make sure you don't give yourself away. That's really good because I was going to ask later on, actually, and let, this is probably an apt point now, is how do we get the team involved? Because it's all very well us saying, okay, so experience and knowledge and skill help you with pricing and help you do a better job at pricing and understanding who you're talking to and the negotiation skills that are required for the person opposite you. So how would we get the team involved? But you're not suggesting let's ignore the team. Let's not let the team get involved in the pricing. Let's have pricing agents in the firm. Oh, yeah, no, I want the team involved. In, in fact, I want anybody to step up to the plate that's got an interest in pricing. You know, pricing is a profession. I say that and people are like, well, what does that mean? Well, pricing is a profession, just like law, just like medicine, just like accounting. It's got all the, the characteristics of a profession. The, every Fortune 500 has got a pricing unit inside of it. Now, these are not people that are marketers. They're not financers. They're professional pricers. Um, yeah, I can get a PhD in pricing. I can get a master's. Some schools I can get an MBA in pricing. So it's a profession. So anybody who's got an interest in it can read the literature, read the books. There's a ton out there. There's a professional pricing society that certifies professional pricers. They're one of the groups. And if anybody's got an interest in that, then you can, con it's a skill. You, it's an art, but it's also a skill, meaning the more you do pricing, the better you get. And what I have found is team members are actually some of the most aggressive pricers. Why? Because a lot of times they have to do the work. They're at the coal face. They don't want to see the firm give it away. There, there's incredible nobility in being paid what you're worth. Incredible nobility. You know, Peter Drucker used to say, profit's the price we pay for tomorrow. And when you make a healthy profit, think Apple. When you make a healthy profit, you can invest in R&D. You can hire incredible talent and hopefully keep them. Uh, you can you can make investments in new services. You don't have to worry about every nickel and dime change order because oh geez this client added ten employees and now the payroll time that we who cares you know what matters is taking care of your customers, nurturing them, and and hopefully keeping them for life if if that's important to you and it should be because it, it's going to make your practice more valuable. But there's nothing there's nothing bad about a good profit. Profit is, is healthy. In fact, my mentor, George Gilder, says profit, and I love this line, is an index of your altruism. And altruism means other directed. We're putting the customer first. We're serving their needs. You know, you think about an artist, right? Artists are great because they, they can paint, they can, they can make you emote and look at something and, you know, just be stunned. But what an artist is trying to conjure up is how they feel about a scene or a picture or a movie setting, whatever. An entrepreneur is not thinking about themselves. They're thinking about you and your issues and how to make your life easier. They're serving you. So it's altruism in, in the finest sense. And profit is an index of that. And that's what can make for a healthy firm, a healthy work environment and, and, a, and a flourishing life, not only for the firm owners, but for their customers. What would you say to accountants who are thinking, yeah, that's great, but I'm scared of, of actually having just, just putting that, floating that price out there. What would you say to those accountants that are scared to, to, to offer price for profit? Offer three options, because what you're going to find when you offer three options is you're going to have your first class seat or your think of it as a presidential suite in a hotel. You should be very proud of your presidential suite. You know, you should bring interior decorators, it should be well furnished, it should be spotless, all of those things. That's your best offering. Offer your best offering for a couple of reasons. One, if you never offer a presidential suite, guess what? You'll never sell one. 
And some of your customers do want the presidential suite. You may not know who they are. You may not be able to judge who they are, but they will come forward. The other reason is knowing that that presidential suite is there, even for the customers that buy just a standard room, it throws a halo effect over your, your hotel or your business in general. It's like, wow, yeah, I stayed at that place that's got that incredible presidential suite or where the president stayed or where Marilyn Monroe stayed or whatever it is. And so offer options because options are a way for the customer to kind of sort themselves into the value price trade-off that they want. And it also just, it, it zeroes out negotiation. When the customer says, well, this is still a little bit more than I thought. Could you sharpen your pencil on this? All you have to say is, that's why we have our, you know, bronze option, our lowest priced option. So it takes away negotiation and humans like choice. So put three choices in front of your customer. And I think uh, that'll give you confidence as you start to see the reaction and you start to see a lot of those customers buy the middle option. Some will buy the top one and it'll blow you away. And then you'll get more aggressive in your pricing going forward. But you'll also think about value. And I just don't want to turn this into profit. You know, it's all about profit. It's not. It's about creating more value for your customer. Because the only way that I know of in the long run to have a sustainable, profitable uh, organization is to create more value for the customer. And there's lots of ways to do that. And that's what we should obsess upon. And I think when you value price, you do become obsessed with value. Indeed. What would you also say, though, to those opponents of that three-level pricing that say, well, customers get confused, that it leads to indecision, and oftentimes they just want from you, the professional, to give them your recommendation? That I used to share that view. If you go back and look at the very first edition of my book, I said, don't do options, because that's like giving a Coke customer a Pepsi, something you never want to do. I've changed my mind. What changed? empirical evidence for the people out there. And I've argued with some of them that say shouldn't offer options. It's unprofessional. It's gimmicky. You're like a used car salesman. Then why does every other business on the planet offer options? The, these people blow my mind how, how narrow they are. And have they ever picked up a pricing book? Have they ever read anything? Um, options have been around for a long time. It goes way, way, way back. Uh, there's a reason for it. First off, humans like options. You want to live in a world without options? Try the old Soviet Union. Good luck. You know, there was that Wendy's commercial. I don't know if it's classic Wendy's commercial about choices at Wendy's. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, you can find it on YouTube. People like choice. And it also allows you to do some customer segmentation and figure out exactly um, what, you know, give the customers exactly the value price trade-off they want. Now, if, if I just have to sit in a vacuum and try and come up with exactly what my customer wants, even based on a very thorough value conversation, I'm, I, I can promise you I'm going to miss the mark. This is why Apple doesn't customize things for you. It gives you options. And, you know, Apple's a very successful company. So the people that argue against options it just blow my mind. It goes against uh, hundreds of years of empirical evidence on how we buy things. Can I get back to timesheets? Uh, we've had so many, as you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversations on LinkedIn about timesheets in the run up to this event. And lots of people getting very defensive of timesheets. One of the, and, and you and I will, you know, I, I mean, I, we both know from KPMG days how we had to account for units and multiples of six minutes. I think I was, I think you were 15 minutes. Um, and we all know, we, we won't argue the validity of, of, the, of, of what's being put into the timesheet in the first instance and how, you know, the pressures there in, in large organizations to make the numbers work. What would you say to people on that cost effect? So we've had a lot of people say, okay, I don't use time for billing. I use a value price or a menu price or whatever combination thereof of pricing. So I don't use timesheets for, for, for pricing. What I do want to know is what, uh, which one of my clients is taking up the most amount of my time, of my team's time, where that time is going. And, and so effectively, it's, I suppose what they're arguing for is cost analysis. What would you say to those people? Well, this is full disclosure, right? Yes. Honest. And you want unexpurgated? For those people that say to me, 
I need timesheets to figure out cost accounting, and that's probably uh, the last defense that we haven't done a good enough job nuking of the four defenses for timesheets. Um, why? Why do you need to see that? Because they want to check their price. So they're not value pricing. They were value pricing. That'd be the last question on their mind. The first question on a, on a professional pricer's mind is not, <gasps> did we make money on that job? No, no, that's not the question. The question is, how much money did I leave on the table? <laughs> that can't be answered by timesheets or accounting information at all. It has to be modeled and it has to be inferred based upon the customer and the value that we actually created and how happy and satisfied was the customer and all of those things. Um, so to do cost accounting for, uh, to use timesheets as cost accounting is spurious. Now, there's there's some tremendous books out there, but I'll just give you a couple. Um, if any of you have read The Goal by Goldratt, uh, he was a physicist. He had the most loathsome things to say about cost accounting. There's, I've got a two hour lecture by him and you can find it on YouTube. And he just blasts cost accountants because it was, it was strangling his theory of constraints because the cost accountants would get a hold of it and they completely blocked it. So he was really pissed off. He tried to come up with his own version, which was throughput accounting, not very successful. I don't know why accountants are so wedded to cost accounting. We didn't invent cost accounting, engineers did. And engineers put a lot of caveats around it when they invented it. They said, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in this, in this data. It depends on the assumptions you make, blah, 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 blah. But we didn't listen to that. We just kind of picked it up and said, oh, this is, this is wonderful data. And I think the firms that are out there using cost data, what are they doing other than checking their price? What are you going to do if a job goes south and you say, well, the price should have been higher. Well, you should have known that before you did it. <laughs> That's why you have professional pricers. They kind of they kind of have experience with that. They kind of know how to build in cushions so you don't fall into those traps. And the other thing I would say uh, is, look, you have a theory about timesheets, whether it's we need them for cost accounting, we need them for pricing, we need them to measure the efficiency of our team members, or we need them for project management. Those are the four defenses. I think we've nuked every one, but here's the thing. People that say, argue either one of those, all four of them, or some combination thereof, that's a theory. All I need is one aberration to disprove your theory. McKinsey and company, Bain and company, Accenture, don't use timesheets. Hmm. What's that tell you? Lots of accounting firms, thousands of them don't use timesheets. There are law firms out there that don't use timesheets. One of the most successful is Wachtell Lipton, the most profitable firm in the world, does nothing by the hour, nothing. Don't do timesheets. So I think the last time I looked at their profit per partner was almost $8 million per year per partner, Wachtell Lipton. Um, I just need one example to disprove your theory. And I just gave you a bunch. The ball's in your court to refute me. No, people love to argue with me about this, but nobody's read the arguments. Nobody's read the arguments. Take on my books. Take on the arguments. Take on the after action review. One of my problems with the timesheets, besides people lie on it, so people say, oh, well, at least it gives me directional. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid data point for management purposes. I want to blow my brains out. No, it's not. First off, people lie on it. Second off, <laughs> it, it, it just amazes me because people say, well, it's better than nothing. Well, if you and I are lost in New York and we don't have a map and I come up to you and I say, Ainsley, this is great. I've got a map. And you look at my map and you go, yeah, but Ron, this is Los Angeles. And I say, yeah, but it's a map. It's better than nothing. No, it's not. It might get us killed. <laughs> but so, so we haven't thought creatively enough about what replaces the timesheet. And I'll just give you the single silver bullet to replace the timesheet, the after action review, bar none, the best learning tool ever devised by mankind, uh, besides possibly the book. The after action review is amazing. It captures knowledge, allows you to reuse it. It actually improves 
it actually improves the future performance of your team members. Timesheets do not. I could, what am I gonna do if you go 20, 40, 100 hours over on a job? You go over the budget. What am I, what am I gonna do? Looking at a timesheet, does it tell me why you went over? Does it give me any contextual information? Of course not. Does it help me improve in the future? No, but if I did an after action review, the team who worked on that job spent 40 minutes on it, then I would get enough contextual information on how to improve going forward, and I'd capture some knowledge that we'd be able to reuse. So the after action review by itself, by itself, nothing else can replace the timesheet. By the way, it can also replace that other stupid thing that we do called the annual performance appraisal, which is just kabuki theater on stilts. I mean, it's crazy that in the year 2021, we're putting people through this annual performance review. This is this is this is sick behavior. Um, and I, I am just blown away by how many firms have not implemented after action reviews. Paul Dunn and I wrote about it in the firm of the future. I wrote about it in my first book. I've written about it in, in almost all my books. It's the single best learning tool. Every single military unit, probably save North Korea's, uh, uses the after action review. Now we normally don't think of the military as a knowledge organization, but they are, they have a great saying, we never want to build the same bridge twice. And we just, you know, we don't spend enough time reflecting on our actions. And the only way to get true knowledge is to do something, but then step back and reflect on what you learned. The after action review gives you a formal way to do that. And it actually improves future performance, unlike timesheets and annual performance appraisals. So take a good hard look at the after action review. And for any skeptics out there, refute that idea for me. Give me the empirical evidence why that wouldn't work in a knowledge firm. Fantastic. And we used to use after action reviews at my firm, Taiwan Tom. Can you just really summarize, you again, probably doing it better than I'm going to do it, what an after action review is in very simple terms? I mean, there's probably yeah. three questions on that review, isn't it? it? Yeah, it's four. And I've got an agenda, and I'm happy to share uh, an after action review agenda that my co-host, Ted Kless, and I uh, modified for knowledge firms. But it's essentially four questions if you look at the armies. What were the objectives of this mission or this engagement? right? Because we have objectives, right? The Air Force has a saying, always know why the wheels go up, right? Always know why you're flying. <laughs> what's, what's the objective here? Are we doing an air show? Are we dropping a bomb? Um, and then, so what were the expectations of this engagement? What actually happened out there? What the Army calls the ground truth, right? Because we set plans and then reality happens, right? What did Mike Tyson say? Everybody's got a plan or a strategy until they're punched in the face. And then the third question is, what was, what were, why were there gaps between what was expected and what actually happened? And what were the negative and positive consequences from those gaps? And the fourth question, most importantly, how can we do it better next time? Now, if you capture that in a video recording and audio recording, there's so many ways to do it now digitally. The army used to have transcribers doing it. Like court, and they put these things in binders. Now, of course, it's all digital, so it's very easy to access these things. So say you have a new team member and you put them on a pretty complicated assignment. Well, you can go tell them, go, re, you know, go, go look at these four after action reviews and you'll get a good idea of what we're trying to accomplish here because you never want to build that same bridge twice. And that's what the after action review does. Now, people will say, and I did a podcast a few months ago, and, and one of the firms objected and said, well, we can't afford to spend, uh, you know, 40 minutes after every single engagement. I'm not asking you to do it after every engagement. Follow the 2080 rule. Only do it on 20% of your engagements that generate 80% of your revenue or whatever. I mean, don't do it on every little tax return you do. Maybe do a couple of them during busy season. But the point is, as knowledge workers, if all we do is frantically move from one job to another without stepping back and reflecting and talking with others about what we learned, what went right, what went wrong, how are we going to do it better, and sharing that, um, how, how are we going to get better? I mean, th there is a learning curve, and we will go through it. I mean, I'm going to be more efficient doing my thousandth tax return than my first. But what if we were to formalize the process like the Army has done? Uh, and, and put these things in a library somewhere where people could access them when they need it on demand. 
uh, that is what improves future performance. You know, people talk about oh, teams and the magic and the irrefutable laws of teams. We read all these books it, and we've seen Deloitte and other big organizations, and, and there's a ton of them now, by the way, that have gotten rid of the annual performance appraisal, but not one of them has implemented the after action review. Not one of them. And, and, and I find that astonishing because it's proven, it's, it's a true, new management idea. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of management ideas. You know, we're running off management ideas that are 100, 150 years old. Um, there's only been a few revolutions in management thinking. I'm talking about management ideas, not business models, not product innovation, but management ideas. Uh, and the timesheet is 102 years old for crying out loud. Ha has the world changed? in 102 years since, you know, the timesheet dates back to Frederick Taylor. It's archaic. Um, it just, it, we need we need better thinking on some of this stuff. And the after action review, in my mind, is what clobbers the timesheet. There, there's no comparison. Awesome, I can't speak highly enough of them, by the way, from a, from a coming from a practice perspective, how awesome and great they were for our team, those after action reviews. So thank you for giving those four questions. Paul's also put a link in for the chat for Teresa who was asking for an example of it. Um, and that is absolutely dealt with very well in from the future. Now, Andrew, there's two questions that we have before. I, I wanna get into value pricing 2.0 because we're, we're gonna be running out of time soon, but these two questions, let's just go for them first of all. So one was after that, after that after action review comment. So presumably, if you have a recurring project, you would do after action reviews periodically on the assignment, not annually, as it never really ends. So e.g., if running an outsourced finance function, you may review, say, quarterly, depending on the size of the client. Yes. And, I, think and a, yes. I, I think that's right. And I think if, if, but if you did work on a particularly large project while you're delivering those services, you could do an after action review on that. And I'll tell you where this really gets sophisticated and you, you can raise the after action review to the 10th power is once your organization gets comfortable with doing them and they become part of the DNA. And this isn't a technology change. This is a cultural change. The after action review culture, it took 17 years for these to be embedded in the culture of the United States Army. They were introduced post-Vietnam, and it wasn't until the first Kuwait War where they really became part of the DNA of the Army. Uh, now, people tell me that have served, um, we, we changed the toilet paper in the latrine, we're doing an AAR on it. I mean, you can see, you can see photos on Google of troops in the middle of battle, huddling. What are they doing? They're doing an AAR because something in their plan changed. The enemy hit them in an unexpected way. Um, so, but if you want to take the AAR to the 10th power, get good with them internally and then start doing them with your customer. Well, isn't it bizarre that everything that works for us as an accountant or an accounting firm generally is good for our clients too. And it's great to be able to come from a, a place of experience and understanding for the team to be able to share those insights with their clients too. So awesome. absolutely. Eddie, I mean, uh, yes, help their customers implement ARs, but I'm talking about doing an AR on your firm with your customer. How are we doing? How could we oh, do okay. better? That's, that is mind blowing rather than sending out an MPS survey or so, how are we doing survey and you know, drop in the smiley face? No, no, do an AAR if you want honest to goodness, candid feedback. And that's gonna improve your future performance with those customers as well. Indeed, we, we, we used to do them with an outside consultant. It wasn't an AAR, we didn't call it an AAR, but it was effectively, what should we start, stop, keep doing? In, in, in essence, right. and it's a similar, similar process to, to, the, to the after action review. But yeah, definitely, I think get an outside person to do it for you. Don't sit in front of your clients with, with that because I think they tend to hold back. But anyway, that's a, that's a deeper conversation for another day. Two more questions, Ron. One is, I'll get to that second one. I'll get to the first, the simpler one first. One of my bosses at ENY told me that I need to know which clients I should keep and which should go. And that's from Vipple. I assume that's that's their defense of timesheets. We needed to know which clients we should keep and which we should let go of. But I, I, I guess both of us would argue, you know that inherently without timesheets. You do. And there are many other ways to grade your clients other than on time. Uh, but, yeah, but, every, every firm knows they're bad, crappy clients. And if you don't, as a partner or manager, you're probably clueless. So go ask your team. Your team will tell you which are the crappy, toxic customers. 
uh, and and they'll have a better idea about you know whether or not they fudge their timesheets on those team members on those customers as well. And it's just like employees. Do you know your good employees and your duds without looking at timesheet data? Of course you do, because timesheets can't measure passion. They can't measure professionalism. They can't measure customer service. They all of the traits that are predictive of a successful professional, communication skills, listening skills, mentoring skills, learning skills, ability to change skills, all of those things don't show up on a timesheet. And so we know who our, our good and star talent is without looking at timesheets, then we know our customers as well. So timesheets tell me nothing. They're a data point that's absolutely superfluous. And because there's no such thing as a free statistic, timesheets cost the average firm 10% of gross revenue to feed the beast. You know, the time that we spend filling them out, lying on them, fudging them, and then inputting them and then spitting out reports that, you know, are, are looked at a couple days a month to do the billing and we bill in arrears and we sit down and we write off the time because it's like playing chess with yourself. All of these costs are enormous. The billing problems, the collection problems, the accounts receivable drag. You know, I see some of these firms that walk, the partners walk around with their accounts receivable list like it's a fine wine list. No, that's not getting better with age. It's deteriorating and none of that should happen. In, in a value pricing world, the, the payment terms are already set. Just get on with the work and keep the customer happy. Yes, and I, I think as well that over-focus on costs. So if we're focusing too much on timesheets, we're still saying I've, I've done an hour on a $150 tax return. And so I'm okay, or I'm not okay, or whatever length like, the time was on it. Uh, that timesheet analysis isn't saying, what did I lose? by not spending that hour on a due diligence assignment or some great advisory assignment that's sitting there with my top clients. What, what, one of the, def, you know, this part of the cost defense is, well, I have to know the opportunity cost of my team. And that's true. But as any good pricer or economist will tell you, opportunity cost has to be analyzed before you do something. You know, am I going to come to this webinar today or am I going to go to the beach? You already had to make that decision. Uh, if you analyze a job afterwards by looking at all the time that was lied into it uh, and you know studying the the uh, realization utilization and you say oh boy we should you know we really took a bath on that you're not analyzing an opportunity cost you're analyzing a sunk cost you're crying over spilt milk it's too late as my colleague Paul Dunn or uh, Paul uh, Kennedy says if you could have increased the price at the start you should have Perfect. Right. Susan, you've asked a question what type of metrics are good to manage performance. Firm of the future, get your hands on that book. A huge amount of KPIs to use to substitute for timesheets in there, um, and certainly ones that we use to pick for our firm. I want to get on to 2.0, Ron. So what's, what, where are we going? What's the future? What's value pricing 2.0 in the subscription model? 2.0 is not pricing the customer like we do in value pricing 1.0. 2.0 is pricing the relationship and the portfolio. And those two words are really critical. So people say, well, you're playing semantical games. What's the difference between the relationship and the customer? Well, <laughs> the relationship is I have, I want customers to subscribe to your firm. And when you subscribe to a firm, you have a completely different relationship with it. So for example, right now in about 12 cities in the United States, I can subscribe to a Porsche. And if I go for their top plan, which I think is around four grand a month, 3,500, I have access to nine models and I can trade them out as much as I want. I can switch them out every day. Say, hey, bring me an SUV. I got guests coming. They white glove out an SUV. They white glove away my, my you know, uh, convertible. Uh, they pay for everything. Insurance. The only thing they don't pay for is tolls and gas. Now, people say, well, how's that different than buying a car or leasing a car? Because it's not tied to a car. It's not tied to a car. I'm subscribing to Porsche. And since they've rolled out this program, and one of the reasons that it's expanded so much is 80% of the people that have signed up for it are new to the brand. My question is, what do you think those folks will be driving for the rest of their lives? It's not, a it's not about the car. 
It's about the relationship with Portia. And now Portia knows everything about me. They know my preferences. They know where I drive. They, they, there's other ways they can monetize that relationship. There's other ways they can provide innovation and more value, just like uh, Amazon or Netflix does by coming out with new series. And they have a direct relationship with me. And that's what I, that's what I envision for professional firms. I don't want to sell services. I don't want to be in a transactional relationship. Oh, the scope changed. So, you know, Department of Paperwork, change order. No, because we're not selling services. We have a direct relationship that basically says you're in good hands, whatever you need that's covered by your current you know, tier that you're in. You can still have tiers. You can sell first class, business class coach. But if it, 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 we change from scope out of scope to covered, not covered. And that brings an insurance mindset to it, which is what I mean by pricing the portfolio. I'm no longer looking at customer uh, profitability. I don't look at that anyway under VPO. Uh, 1.0, you shouldn't. If you do, you're not doing it right. Uh, but in 2.0, certainly don't look at it because I'm looking at profitability across the entire firm. And I'm also, and even more importantly, I'm looking at uh, lifetime customer value, which has to be modeled and projected, doesn't show up on accounting statements. And th that's a completely different business model. In fact, the income statement of a subscription-based business looks completely different than your standard income statement. And there is absolutely no place, none, zero, zip for timesheets in that model, none. So for me, 2.0 blows up the timesheet, just makes it irrelevant. I mean, you can go out to venture capitalists, uh, you can go check out Andreessen and Horowitz has two reports on the KPIs that they use to analyze subscription business. And I promise you, you won't see timesheet data in those reports. And so from a practical perspective, from an accounting firm, so we've talked about monetize, or sorry, uh, yeah, well, the pricing or monetizing the relationship rather than the, the client. What does that mean in terms of services that, uh, and how would an accounting firm go about that? Yeah, it, uh, um, the model that I like, and this is not might not translate to the rest of the world as much, but in the United States, we've had this thing called concierge medicine that started up in about 1996. And it really went after like the top 1%, you know, the CEOs, and they charge them like 30 grand a year, general physician, 30 grand a year, family of four, you're covered, whatever you need, you're covered. Anything I can do under my roof as your general physician, you're covered. Um, and then, of course, now we have direct primary care doctors that go for a lower price point. So this is really diffused. There's about 1,500 of these practices across the United States. And the price points vary. You know, some of them are 130 bucks, 100 bucks a month. Others are $500 a month. But basically, the doctor's saying to you, anything you need that I'm capable of doing as a GP, you're covered. And if you need a specialist, if you need an oncologist or a surgeon, I will quarterback that relationship. I can refer you to one in our network or personal reference, uh, and I will come with you to the, um, the consultation. I, I will quarterback that relationship. These physicians have 600 patients as opposed to a general physician that has over 3,000. So the reason people go into medicine is because they want to help people. And then they get into these fee-for-service practices that have over 3,000 patients. So now I can spend five minutes with every patient. You know, I have 30 patients a day, 40, sometimes 40. And I'm spending five to seven minutes with them. Half the time, I'm looking into my computer screen, typing in their electronic health records. One doctor said I became a better typist than doctor. That's not why they entered the profession. Now, when I ask CPAs, why did you become a CPA? You get two overwhelming responses to help people or you know maybe to help businesses but it comes down to helping people i want to help people and that's what we do but we lose sight of that when we get into a fee for service for transaction mindset that's not what we're selling we're not monetizing the relationship we're monetizing the transactions and that's the flaw in the business model of even dare i say it value pricing 1.0 we pay lip service to the relationship we say we say things like well we want to be our customer's most trusted advisor well not if i look at the way that you're paid if i look at the way you're paid you're selling transactions you're selling cars you're not doing what porsche is doing you're not inviting me into a relationship and nurturing that 
Now, sure, they have to continue to produce new cars and bring me new models and innovate and all of that, but that's what they do. But I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them or my doctor, and that's what I envision for value pricing 2.0 for accounting firms. Cool, I can hear some of the accountants. Uh, I think people have been absorbed by this, so we're not getting a huge amount of questions coming through, but um, I assume some people out there are screaming at this all-you-can-eat mentality and going, well, we'll have clients that will take complete advantage. What do we say about fair usage policy? Yes, uh, somebody has got a thread out right now on the whole all-you-can-eat. It sounds like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right, uh, for one price. That's not what I'm saying. You can still have options. You can still, you know, Netflix offers options, right? Um, the, the, if you look at most subscription businesses, they still offer options. So there's still ways to segment the customer. But if, let me ask people this, that worry about that all you can eat buffet. Would you offer it at the right price? See, that's the question. Lloyd's of London will insure a satellite. They'll even insure JLo's backside. How do they do that? Well, actuaries have a great saying. There's no such thing as a bad risk. There's only bad premiums. So at the right price, of course you'd do it. And what I'm saying in this concierge model is your price is probably going to be three to four times higher than you're charging now. And you're going to have less customers. But you know what? You're going to have more capacity to go broader and deeper with every one of those customers, precisely why you got into this profession to begin with. So it's no longer about chasing every single hour and every dollar and every tax return and every other service we can do. It's about developing and nurturing that relationship and increasing that lifetime value. And then when you go to sell your practice, it's going to be worth more than a multiple of one times revenue. Value pricing, you might get two times revenue, you might get two and a half, three. I've seen, I've seen three and a half with value pricing. Subscription, we're seeing seven and up. And here's the thing. If you think about the firm Pilot, you probably heard about Pilot that Jeff Bezos invested $300 million in. The firm was worth a million, a billion dollars, one billion dollars for a startup accounting firm with a thousand customers. That valuation comes from the fact that they have annual recurring revenue, that they're on a subscription model. The market is screaming at businesses, we want annual recurring revenue. That's what matters. Lifetime value is what matters. And we're chasing dying metrics, I think, in our older business models. We're counting units. Who cares how many iPhones were sold? Who cares how many hamburgers McDonald's sells? What matters is, what's the revenue per customer? And how can we nurture that and how can we grow that and do it in a way where the customer has a psychological bond to our organization. And you can only do that in a subscription world. You can't do that in a value pricing world because even in the value pricing world, we're still monetizing the transaction, not monetizing the relationship. And that's a big difference. Wonderful, Ron. And from coming from an accounting world to a SaaS world, which I'm now in, I, I certainly understand the revenue per user and monthly recurring revenue and ARR, et cetera, et cetera. Jennifer, I just wanted to let you know, Jennifer, who's uh, probably you will have seen from, or maybe know from QuickBooks World, Quick, QuickBooks Connect, she's saying she has she could listen to you talking all day on pricing and has listened to you talking on pricing all day, but that you've just brought new perspective to the subscription model and that Porsche story is absolutely awesome. So. Thanks, Ron. Paul's asking, well, is there any, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, I, I know there's questions out there. I see one from Susan. How, how do you price in the subscription model? What guidance exists? Susan, I hate to say this, but there is no guidance yet. I mean, there, are, there is guidance. If you look for it, you have to study the medical profession. Uh, but here's the thing. We are in a renaissance with the subscription economy. I feel like I'm in California, so I feel like I'm in a gold rush. I, it's like drinking from a fire hose. I can't keep track of all the subscriptions. I can subscribe to a home now. Through Brunswick, I can subscribe to a boat with a captain who will give me education on how to sail it. Um, in five years time, Teen Zo, the uh, author of Subscribe, which is a great book, Teen Zo says, you won't own anything. You'll subscribe to everything. now." I won't go that far. I still think there'll be a place for ownership and we will want to own some things. But I will say this, in five years time, you will have the option to subscribe to everything. And your firm's going to have to deal with that 
even if, even if you don't move to this model. You know, when we see tectonic shifts happening in the economy, Joseph Schumpeter called it creative destruction, call it revolution, call it whatever you want. But revolutions don't care what you think. They just come, you know, nobody can forbid us our future, right? These things are gonna come because the customers love it. They love the convenience, the flexibility, the peace of mind, being able to cancel, suspend uh, a subscription. It's frictionless. And that's the kind of experience we need to create for our customers and move away from this, trying to monetize every little bit, every hour or every transaction. It's just crazy. We're professionals. Let's just nurture and take care of our customers to the best of our ability. And subscription gives you the flexibility to do that. Ron, thank you so much for your insights today. It has been incredible. Um, we have gone over, so I thank everybody for their patience and thanks Ron for, for sharing and staying with us. I just wanted to remind you, and I, I, I'll, I'll see if Ron can stay on a little bit. If you've got any questions, then we can deal with them, but just let's just go through for those that need to fly off. We've got two more sessions coming up on the full disclosure pricing series. So next week, we've got Jody Paydar, who's going to be talking about scoping and pricing like a pro. Now, Jody as well comes from practice. She's been there. She's written the Radical CPO and has created a movement of Radical CPAs in the US. And certainly value pricing was a key element to her uh, transformation of her practice and subsequently her involvement with Botkeeper. So do uh, join us for Jody Paydar. And the last one is James Ashford, who's going to be talking about feel the fear and take the jump. So this is about mindset. It's about this imposter syndrome. It's about we all get pricing. Why are we so afraid of it? And why can't we just take that jump and move forward? So please do join us for those two. And also, we've got an awesome event coming up with our chief storyteller here at Clarity, Paul Dunn. It's about <laughs> the new story of advisory. So it's about pricing process and so, so, so much more. Now, this is looking at the challenges and issues with why advisory has been difficult to introduce and implement and, and, and scale within the accounting firm, but it's more than that. It's about how do you make that dramatic shift that's needed in your accounting firm to make that dramatic shift and those, those wonderful changes that you can have with your clients. So please do sign up for that too. The link is there. Maybe Paul could type it in for me quickly because I'm going to be uh, skipping back to something else. I can't type on this. So if you could just go pages.clarity-hq.com forward slash story. So it's not the shortest of URLs, but please do join us for that amazing event. And as always, Paul is a master storyteller. So we're in for a treat with that one. And if you've got any questions or would like to find out more about Clarity, then please do click on the the QR code on screen. You can book a discovery call with one of our team and we can talk to you about what Clarity can do and how we can help you make a massive difference in your accounting firm too. So Ron, thank you so much. If you've got to go, I thank hugely you. appreciate your time. If no, I can stay for a while. Questions, if we've got any more questions for Ron, then happy to, to deal with those questions too. And in fact, I'll go off immersive view so we can bring Paul into screen as well. Fantastic. Paul, good to see you. Well, we can't see you because my screen is frozen, but hopefully you're there. These are the hardcore people now that are left, right? So oh. uh, yeah, exactly. ask the tough yeah, questions. I'm, uh, I'm here, Ains. I had some challenges getting that link in as well. My apologies. Yeah, no, no problem. Good. I can probably type it now that I'm off that screen. Uh, I'm, I'm doing it. Can you imagine an accountant with just one screen? That's terrible. Uh, and, and with uh, with so much, so many people staying on, it's just incredible, uh, guys. Ron, thank you for that. So many people said I could listen to Ron all day. Here's an interesting thought. Put a Y in the chat if you would like to listen to Ron for at least another hour. Not today. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> at least another hour. And Ron, I, I put in the chat that uh, maybe, just maybe, uh, there might be an opportunity to talk about the new book at some time, right? Maybe not now, but there is a new book coming, we think. Yep. So, yeah. Looking hey, forward Phil, to that. Could, Phil's got a why, why, why. Jessica's got a why. <laughs> <laughs> right, Thank you, was, everybody. Uh, yeah, it was really, really great. And uh, I, I think Ainsley got it absolutely right when he, he said everybody was so absorbed. I mean, it's just uh, just stunning stuff. Oh, stunning I love stuff. this. Jennifer Baldick. Oh, wow. Yep. Jennifer, what a great, yeah. great question. That's exactly what Radiohead did with their album. You know, they made you go in 
and they had a null box there and you had to type in a price and there was three you know there were as many digits but you had to type in you know price point cents and all of that so if you had to, if you wanted it zero you had to type zero point zero zero so meaning i'm cheap i'm cheap i'm cheap and they let the customer set the price and they said we did much better than if we would have sold this through a record label it's about 15 years ago i think radiohead it's a great pr pricing story so that that i think that could be a model that we move to great great point jennifer yeah excellent yeah, exactly good jennifer and now we know ron's taste in music as well so yeah. <laughs> I've never actually heard Radiohead, so no, I, I, <laughs> I but, 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 but I know exactly. the pricing story. Uh, <laughs> well, that's cool because when in your book from the future, you talk about Tim and the tip, uh, the tip clause. And yes. yeah. I, I did think reading that, I did think, wouldn't it have been better of Tim to say to his client, well, what do you think the value of that, that engagement is? Right. Indeed. Yeah, uh, left. Paul Miller, yeah. is, is Ron's new book on V? Value pricing 2.0. Yes. <laughs> and Ron, can I ask you, Ron? Can I can I ask this question? It's a question I love asking. It is this: What, what question? Should, if there was one question that we should have asked you during this, what would the question be? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought Ainsley did an awesome job, by the way. You, oh, no, thanks. he did. Obviously, um, not good enough. <laughs> you, no, you know no, the, no, no, no. It's just one of those questions. Yeah, the, the, the cost accounting, um, you know, this is something that we have a new fellow at Verisage. His name is Dr. Reginald Lee. He's amazing. He's an engineer. And it's, it's very uh, poetic because an engineer's led us into cost accounting and he's an engineer leading us out. And he's written several books, two of which I'll recommend, and I meant to say this earlier, uh, Lies, Damn Lies, and Cost Accounting. Probably the best book title ever. Lies, Damn Lies, and Cost Accounting by Reginald Lee. And his second book is called Strategic Cost Transformation. Now, full disclosure, I wrote the foreword to that book, but I wrote the foreword because it's an amazing book. And this guy has destroyed cost accounting. He's just destroyed it, period, end game. It's done. Now, cost accountants will never admit it. I'm having a huge debate with Rick Payne about Reginald's work, Paul. He thinks Reginald's full of, full of crap uh, and it gets it gets his blood pressure up but um, the problem is he hasn't read Reginald's work yet um, read the book and come to your own conclusion but uh, it's it's amazing and it just you know the problem with cost accounting is you get different answers depending on what method that you use so it's not it's not a true measure it's a metric and metrics are contrived based upon the categories and the assumptions we make if you and I walk outside with a thermometer Two, two, two thermometers, assuming they're good, we're probably going to get the same temperature reading. But if I use two different accounting, cost accounting methods, I'm going to get two different answers for cost per unit. And there's nine sanctioned or so different cost accounting methods that will give you nine different answers. So it's like it, it, there's a law called Siegel's Law. A man with one wa watch is certain of the time. A man with two never is. And Susan, if you look at my screen, there's an answer to your question right there. <laughs> Is that the, what are the sum of the techniques or questions that you pose to overcome pricing yeah, objections? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. yeah. Perfect. Cool. And Ron, it's been absolutely a pleasure. Wonderful. Oh, thanks, you We've guys. So many people stay on, so it's been great fun. Oh, I hope I've done yeah, a, I mean, that's a, this was oh, great. A wonderful job. Wonderful job. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Good. I'm happy to do um, it I again. I do hope to meet you in real life. Good. Well, I think too. it would be really great to take that conversation on from 2.0 because I think, I think unfortunately, we had to deal with a lot of rubbish before then. Yep. Um, but you'll probably say, but I, I uh, really would like to take that 2.0 conversation forward. I think so I, you know, people would love to be there. People think I'm crazy, but 2.0 blows up 1.0. Now, there's still some value pricing principles that apply. Don't get me wrong. Um, but but 2.0 is a completely different animal. And the thing is, we don't, we don't know all the ramifications yet. So we're kind of, we're kind of groping in the dark, which is what's so damn exciting about it. This is a renaissance. It's an effervescence that is just amazing to be a part of. Awesome. All right, you guys, thanks so much. Good to see okay. you, Paul. Well, 